and welcome back everybody. My name is Eltamar and we are going to be continuing our Let's Play of Planescape Torment. Where we left off last time, we were handing in a bunch of miscellaneous quests. I discovered that, uh, if we go to our journal here, we cannot actually finish the source of Verod's Bodies for Emmerich quest, which is unfortunate, because we never really asked Verod where he got the bodies. We know where he got the bodies, logically, but we don't have his speaking to us proof, so we can't actually do that yet. Which is unfortunate, but oh well. Um, so that also gets rid of this one too. Talk to Mar about the box. I don't remember where Mar is, but we're going to figure that out in a little bit. And we have to find the Night Hag Ravel Puzzle Well. That's part of our main quest. Right. So we are in the Clerk's Ward. We're going to go talk to Diligence first. This older, stern looking woman is clearly on her way somewhere. When she notices your approach, she studies you with a disapproving, tight lipped frown. Greetings! The woman nods, curtly speaking in a cold tone as ice. Or sorry, in a tone cold as ice. Yes, what is it? And what's your words? I am Diligence, 4th Magistrate of the Ward. Something troubling about my appearance? I should most certainly think so. Should the Apparel Regulation Act be passed, people of your sort won't be permitted to traipse in such a manner, half-naked and filthy as you are. Um, let's see. I'm quite clean. Begging your pardon and meaning no disrespect, madame, some cultures might find your clothes offensive. She examines you skeptically for a moment, then nods. Your point is well taken, sir. Still, though, you cannot deny you are a rather rough-looking sort of fellow. My appearance is merely a product of my environment, madame, and a difficult life. I shouldn't be held accountable for that. Oh, but you should. How easy it is for one to blame one's life one's surroundings for their very er or every failing. I can see by your manner you are well educated, sir, yet you appear to insist upon a lifestyle of wandering and senseless violence. Why not settle in sigil, become a contributing citizen rather than some bloody-handed nomad in its streets? The choice is out of my hands, I assure you. Oh, how so? Her coldness melts away with a look of curiosity. I'm going to tell her my story or what I know of it. That is quite a tale, sir. Were it only a tale, madame, it is my life, and I have the scars to prove it, and as you've noted when we first met, I believe. Yes, yes, quite so, she smiles slightly. You had begun to wonder if she was even capable of such a thing. I wish you luck, sir, in your undertakings. May you find yourself once more. My thanks, Pharaoh Lady Diligence, and her bodyguard, Matter of Course. Mercy Healers always have cool names. Alright, so we are going to head up to the store first. We need to talk to someone called Malmeter... Mal... Malmanner. This. This thin, sharp-faced man rushes towards you, calling for your attention. Ah, sir, sir, but a moment of your time. Were you perhaps... or perchance here to visit the tailor? I what? The man breaks in. I asked, sir, because I seem to have uh, offended the man. I had commissioned the hot-blooded fool to make me a costume, but he's thrown me out of his shop and will not speak with me now. So what? Uh, the man suddenly balls his fists and shakes them at the sky. What have I done to deserve such treatment? Nothing I say. I was a patron. It is his duty to serve me, that churlish buffoon. What did you want from me? Eh? He focused on you? Oh, uh, yes, you. Can I beg of you to enter the place and fetch my costume for me, sir? I've got a masquerade to go to, and I have not the time to commission another tailor. Yeah, I'll do it, but not for free. Yo, what? For the power's sake, man, you're just fetching a costume. It won't take but a moment of your time. I certainly don't think such a meager act is worth a wage, sir. Alright, fine, I'll go get it then. Oh, most excellent, sir. This is very building right here. He points to the long, low structure just north of him. I thank you, sir. We might as well go fetch it. It's worth some experience, even though he's kind of a tool bag. All right, let's go talk to Goncalves. Gone calves, whatever. The short, heavy-set, middle-aged man is wearing clothes that seem to be spun of glittering gold. In his hands, he holds a bolt of cloth strung taut across a wooden frame. He is currently embroidering some pattern into the fabric. Greetings! The man doesn't seem to acknowledge your presence. He continues to work at his embroidery, muttering under his breath as he sews. Shimmering motes of light seem to sparkle and drip or drop from the tip of it, the needle. Good sir, did you hear me? The man does not look up from his work, frowning distastefully as he answers you. Yes, yes, I'm certain that what you need is quite urgent. Now, if you could be silent for just a moment, I will wait quietly. At last, he sets down the embroidery and looks upon you. Before you can speak, however, he picks up another item and sets to work on it. Again, as he works, what looks to be tiny colored sparks drip from the fabric. I have hiccups. They're really annoying. I'm going to wait some more. He finally finishes his work setting it down to examine you. Greetings, I am Goncalves. Now what was it... Goncalves, really? Now what was it you were here to see me about? I had some questions. Hmm. 
Hope tis about garments and the like. I shan't answer anything not concerning myself or the store, you know. I wanted to pick up a dustman costume. You are in luck, sir. I have one available. Its cost is 30 copper commons. I'll take it. Gone Calves takes a set of neatly folded robes from under the counter. Here you are, sir. I would warn you, though. If this is for the upcoming masquerade of Lord Eard, many folk are already attending as dustmen. Keep that in mind. Farewell, Gonclaves. Calves. Can't run while I'm carrying all this. Can't run while I'm can't, can't run while You're I'm encumbered by dustman robes. Are you serious? I guess they do weigh five, and our strength is abysmally low. Um, let's see. Well, that's actually a really nice earring. Is that better than my earring? What do I have? Two armor class and two additional first level spells. I think mine's better. So let's give this to. Can you wear earrings more? No. Can you wear earrings? Apparently not, even though you have giant ears. What's this one do again? Lux. Yeah, whatever. We're going to give you armor class instead. All right. Now I can run can't again, right? Run while nope. I can't run while I'm carrying all this. I guess I don't need this hammer all that much anymore. Let's give it to her. Um, uh, She's almost full. Let's give it to him. We'll get rid of some of the other junk later. All right, let's go give this thing to him. The man looks at you expectantly. Well, well, did you get the costume from Goncal Goncalves? Yes, here it is. It cost me 30, or 30 commons. Fine, fine. Take it. Here. He tosses you 30 copper commons. Now I've got to be off. Wait! Goncalves said many people were already going to this masquerade as dustmen. Did he? Blast! I would hate to arrive as such a common costume. Hmm. I could go see if he has another one ready. Not a bad idea. Not bad at all. Quickly, see if that portly Ningapoop has another, will you? I'll return with another costume. Because... We want more experience. I just had some questions. I wanted to pick up another, different costume. Goncalves nods and smiles knowingly. The dustman bit seemed a bit too common after all, eh? Well, it just so happens that I have a godsman costume. If you would like, it shall cost you only 50 coppers. I'll take him. He retrieves a set of folded clothing, a heavy leather apron, and work boots from under the counter. Here you are, sir. Enjoy the masquerade. Thank you, sir. We are O-U-T. Well, well, did you get the costume from Goncalves? Yes, here it is. 50 commons this time. He makes a disgusted noise, snatches the costume off from you, and shows or shoves 50 coins into your hand. Now I've got to be off. Bye. So we got a whole bunch of experience for that, which is awesome. 14,000 spread out among the group, which means that she gained a fighter level. Which means that her fighting skills have improved. She also got some new hit points. So she's pretty decent now. Fighter of 6, Thief 6. We have a Fighter 6, Mage 6. We have a... Fighter 7 straight up, and we have a Mage 9 straight up. Not too bad. We're going to go back in here and actually go to his shop, because he actually has stuff to buy, and I want to take a look at it quickly. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. All right. So, he has a, a Jerkin for Anna, which is actually really quite nice. Armor class 4, Thacko plus 1. It is a Jerkin of the Brazen Rogue. I wonder if we can steal it. What are our odds? It doesn't tell us what our odds are. What is our pickpocket skill? Let's find that out first. Mm -hmm. Pickpockets. 50%. Ah, let's give it a shot. If we fail, we just quick saved anyway, so... We'll... You know. Not this time. Oh, that's bad. Yep, yeah, that's what happens when you uh, fail at stealing. Things go really bad really quickly. Alright, no ceiling. Let us leave. We're off to our next place. Um, which is actually way over here. There is a place to go down there that goes to Under Sigil. We're not going down there yet. All right. Done. I'm gone. We will be going there eventually, of course, but not quite yet. Um, what did this guy do? Oh, this is the Sylvic Fest Hall, so we're not going to go in here quite yet. Although we can talk to Salabish the Onyx while we're here, I guess. This tall, thin man, dressed in heavy crimson robes, has sharp, pinched features. He bows regally as you approach him. I am Salabish, oft called Salabish the Onyx, future mage tutor for the Civic Fest Hall. You business with me, I take it? No, just some questions. About what, hmm? Not the war and the like, I hope. Plenty more common folk could answer such questions, and I'd just as soon direct you to one of them. Why are you called the Onyx? A long tail, which I'll shorten to save my breath. In my youth I was once called Salabesh the Golden, for I was said to have the heart of gold, small, hard, and yellow. Well, I cursed the fool who started that, so that he could only speak from his arse and defecate through his mouth. The onyx appellation, along with the same lines as the golden, although admittedly somewhat less clever, soon followed. In any case, a much kinder fellow now, far less prone to laying curses and the like. I'm not certain I deserve the name any longer. You cursed him 
so that he... what? Oh yes, you heard right. Zelbesh sighs happily and chuckles to himself. That sort of thing is why I'm known as the Master of Curses, you know. Okay, that is just messed up, dude. All right. Why would you do that? Although, we could quickly talk to him again and ask him about what the mage thing is. What do you mean by future mage tutor of the Fest Hall? It's a prestigious position to be an official tutor in one of the Fest Hall's training chambers. Train me there. Good God. Training chambers. It is my intention to one day take the position of the mage's tutor, but the title's currently in the possession of Lady Thorncombe. If only I could somehow prove that I'd be superior tutor. That's all. Okay, so now we know about Lady Thorncombe. That was important. Sort of. Um... Where do we want to go? I guess we can go to, uh... Down here, I guess. There's a couple people to talk to down here. Eli Havelock. This narrow, eye sharp faced man is scanning his surroundings with a look of vague disinterest, pausing occasionally to look down and pick at his fingernails. Despite being clothed in silk and velvet finery, he manages to look unsavory and more than a little dangerous. Greetings! The man looks your way. His eyes are dark slits like narrow stab wounds beneath his brow. His voice is low and gruff despite his slender build. Pike off. Not yet. I had some questions. You think I'd wander the ward looking for strangers to spill the dark for? Now pike off. Why are you here then? To be surly with passersby? Heh. <laughs> he stands quietly for a moment that breaks into a crooked smile. That's good, that. He considers you for a moment. I'm a tutor at the Civic Fest Hall. Name's Havelock. Eli Havelock. As a veteran scout, I teach the other subterfuge. You mean thievery. His lip curls in a disgusted sneer. Thieves and thievery it always is. Five tours and I spend as a reconnaissance operative in the War of Lies. Scout is my title. Scout! I teach the ways of stealth and spycraft, not common thievery. I see. We can learn to become a thief, but we're not going to. We really need to rest. Can we rest here? No. Nope. We'll find a place to rest later. Um, we're going to go to the brothel, right? Which is over here. Brothel can be next, I guess. Or maybe not. We're going to go in the brothel in a different video, I think. Because it is extensive and we get a new character there. So I'm going to do that in a different video, I think. Yeah, that's a better idea. We'll finish the rest of this district first and then we'll do the brothel. And then we'll do the, uh, what's that place called? Um, Civic Fest Hall. Those are two big buildings with a lot of stuff inside of them. So it'll take a bit of time to go through. This is the apothecary. Let's just see what he has going on here. You see a well -eye or wall-eyed fellow whose skin seems to writhe and ripple across his entire body. He is smacking his chapped lips with a blushed tongue. As you watch, his right eye moves independently of the left, focusing on you. A second later, the left one flicks to look your way, then reverts back to his original position. The right eye blinks. A strange gurgling comes from his throat. Greetings? The man gives a lopsided grin and points to himself with his right thumb. Pestilam called the <laughs> alchemist. He points at himself. Again, this time with his last index finger. The name's Kiln. Ha! You need some? Are you alright? I am Hawk. His throat suddenly convulses for a moment, then relaxes. A large green glowing pustule suddenly bursts from the side of his neck. Something I needed then, sir. Hawk. His throat clutches again, and a wave of quivering flesh swallows the blistering green pustule back beneath the flesh of his throat. This is disgusting. He coughs violently for a moment, then seems to relax. Phew. May I ask what happened to you? The left eye rolls up in er, exasperation. The right eye looks askance. Too much to drink. Too much of what, though? Potions I drank. Too many potions. Flock! His mouth slides down beneath his chin, and his left nostril forms another one. The most I ever drank, that's for certain. Of polymorphins they were, and they brewed. Ah, in limbo. Anything I can do to help? The man's eyes turn inwards to look at each other, then back to you. Dunno, flock! He shudders. The mouth below his chin moves to envelop the one his nostril formed. This sort of thing happens quite often. We can't seem to blah, help but sample the stock. If you can find a way to help, the two of us would blah, be grateful, sir. I had another question. I don't, okay. Half of hit the mouth curls downwards into a frown. He shakes his head. Work in the stock room all day, I do. Glack! He shudders violently. Suddenly, a third eye pops open on the bridge of his nose. The left one shifts sideways as the new one takes his place. I speak only of the flock store, sir. That said, the skin of his face seems to eat the new eye, and the left one returns to its old location. What? The old engineer in the foundry tells me I need to get a sample of my blood and skin for his machine to work. I need you to do that for me. A scraping. Very well. Well, his right hand takes up a razor blade. His left 
a wide mouth bottle. He removes a small section of skin from your forearm, placing it into the bottle, along with a small quantity of your blood. He then places some gauze over your wound and hands you the bottle. You need anything? More, sir. Uh, let's take We can take a look what he has. Even though he has... And sell some junk. That's what we'll do. That thing is worth 8,000. Damn, I want to sell that. We're going to find ourselves a weaponsmith. Can I sell anything here? This guy doesn't buy anything. What a chip. What a crappy store. All right. How am I supposed to sell all my junk if you won't buy it? Oh well. Let's go talk to Aylwin, I guess. Um, actually, no, we don't need to talk to her quite yet, I don't think. Nope. Uh, we gotta go talk to someone else before we talk to Aylwin. She is useful in a moment. There's, a, there's another shop here somewhere. I wish it's Elevarond. Is she the fortune teller? No, thanks. I don't need my fortune told. Okay, I'll read what it says because something happened. This old woman examines you closely with her sharp gray eyes. First your face, then your arms and various tattoos. Greeting, scarred one. Come to speak with El Lobron, have you? Come to have your fortune told me up for a paltry five coins. I said no thanks. Hold one moment, scarred one. Elbron reaches out, touching your arm. My mother gave me something once, long ago. A scroll sealed with wax. The hooded man had entrusted it with her and said that a man such as he would would you yeah, would what yeah. Holy crap, why can't I talk? A hooded man had entrusted her and said that a man such as you would one day unwittingly come to claim it. Here, I would have you take it now. What is it? Elbron shakes her head, frowning. I do not know. She was sworn never to read the thing, and I obeyed her request to leave the seal unbroken myself. The man had paid her handsomely to take the scroll, but warned her of the direst consequences should she open it. There we go, I can talk again. I have no idea why I couldn't get that sentence out. Suspicious sealed scroll. Hmm. I don't remember it. I think it's bad. Actually, I'm pretty sure it's really bad. So we're not going to do it. That's not the store. Where'd the store go? Is that up further? Maybe it's down further. It's down further, for sure. It's this building here. I don't know why. I thought it was up there. Oh, please. Let's go upstairs. We're gonna go to the curiosity shop. And maybe we'll be able to sell some of our crap there, hopefully. You're not the shopkeeper. Vrishka is the shopkeeper. This sharp-featured woman's appearance is attractive, though somewhat disturbing, with her blue-black skin and bright yellow eyes. As she examines you, a small pair of bat-like wings unfold from her back, then seem to settle into her skin. Well, well, a floating disembodied... Prever... Wow. Preverisating... Preverisating skull. She narrows her eyes. You, you're the scarred man who's been going around asking all the questions. She looks you up and down. You sure look lost. Did you want to come in? Really? Or are you just casing the place in case you have nothing better to do? Because Vrishika, she indicates herself, can help you. How can you help me? I travel and trade extensively. I hear a great deal. I purchase a great deal. And I own a great deal. Perhaps I can make you a great deal. Is there anything you desire? Perhaps. What are you selling? Would you care to examine the weapons and charms? Or perhaps some of my more exotic acquisitions? The exotic items. Vrishika smiles as you look at the various shelves in the middle of the shop. If you see nothing you like here, there are more items towards the front and back of the store as well. There's a lot of things. I think the... Is that the cube? 1500. Um, that is... Is that the cube that I need? I can't remember for the life of me. I can't... I think that's mod or Modron? Modron Cube, I think it is. Uh, do I want to buy it for 1500 I think it is the cube that we want. Because we get a character if we do it. We get the Modron, who's actually a really cool character. Hmm. You know what? Why not? I'll take it. Yes, Vrishika purrs, a wise choice. The copper you pour into her hand seems to disappear the moment it touches her palm. She hands you the item. Please enjoy your newest acquisition. Let's look at the normal stuff now, because we got lots of things to sell. 
we're going to sell the Tome of Bone and Ash. It is functionally worthless. We're selling the Justifier because we need to get some money back. And It's a decent weapon, but it's usable only by fighters, and we have no one that can use it. So that's not really useful for us. The Grimoire of Pestilent Thought will keep... Oh, actually, no, we're one. It's evil. What I might do, actually, before I sell it off is I will... It makes me do a bunch of quests, and they're all evil quests. I'm just not going to do it, I'm not going to lie. It's, I don't want to become evil, and I don't want to spend the time wandering around to do that. The Modron Cube is what we wanted, that is excellent. We have a whole bunch of money now. We're going to get rid of all of these rings and junk. Get some monies for that. Um, what does this do again? No, oh, stealth, whatever. Sell that. And the Mage's Guard is worse than what he's currently using. So we'll get rid of that too. And she's just carrying a bunch of skulls. She's got these crappy earrings, so we'll get rid of that. We'll get rid of the Cranium Rat Charm as well. Now, does she have anything we want? Heart of the Fosterer. Oh, that summons something, right? Spider Bracelet is so-so. Uh, it's good for thieves, I guess. Oh, I hate hiccups. Immunity to panic, plus one strength. That's nifty. Magnifying glass, plus ten to lore skill, minus two to damage. The teeth of the fire drake are actually really nice. They are plus one teeth with three to eight fire damage, and immunity to fire. They are pretty worthwhile. I'm going to take a look at her um, exotic stuff again, though, just to see if there's anything else we want to buy there. There might be. And the Hammer of Communicure... Communution... Communution? Communution. Alright, let's go, Vrisha. What else you got for stuff? Yes, I am. Exotic items. We're looking for possible teeth. There's a Monster Jug, a Gorgon Salve, and a Fiend's Tongue. I don't think we need any of those things, but... We'll take a look anyways, eventually. Um, baby Oil, a Chocolate Quasit. The Codex of the Inconceivable, Diva's Tears, Elixir of Horrific Separation. Let's go to the back of the store. There is a rune-covered Aelstein, Stained Lens, Yevra's Ring, and that's it. Now the thing is, you can't really tell what they do until you buy them at her store. This is a really cool item. We will not be doing it right away, but uh, that'll be where we get another character in the game, the Modron Cube. He is pretty cute. We're gonna go to the linguist home, I think, now. There's a thug group around here. Let's see what they have to say for themselves. Uh, yeah, let's I'm go gone. see what they have to say for themselves. The young but well-muscled thug, while certainly well-armed and large enough to be dangerous, seems awfully clean for a typical street tough. He's carrying a massive axe in one hand and a steel box in the other. As you're near him, he puffs up and scowls at you. What are you looking at, sod? Pike off before I gotta scrag ya. Scrag? What in the nine planes of Beto are you talking about, ya idiot? Scrag's nagged, nipped, and yanked by hardheads, ya clueless Al Kyberk. He glares daggers at Anna but says nothing. You do seem a little well-groomed for a thug. Stop shaking your bone box, Leatherhead. This is my territory, and you'll be leaving quickly if you don't want my bloods to be tear you apart. Anna snickers, shaking your head. Rattle, you sod. Rattle on your bone box as it is. I'd so like to see how long you'd last dropped smack in the middle of the hive, acting as you are. Anna turns to you. Come on, let's be off. No use wasting our time with this wee stem basher would be. His face flushes as he gnashes... His teeth in frustration. That's it! Yeah, Pike can ask for it! Get him, Bloods! He raises his axe and leaps to attack. We're gonna fight him. I'm not scared of you. I'm a fool. Maybe I am a little bit scared of you. Let's not get overrun. Alright, one of the Bloods dead. And we're gonna go. Boo! We're gonna go. Force missiles. To the face. That wasn't a lot of force missiles, that's it. Okay. And I think we won. He didn't really stand up a chance. But we got a steel box, I don't know what it is. The battle axes are worthless, they're worth like one gold or something. The rings though, they're worth 40 like normal, so... They're worth picking up, I guess. That is, unless you have no inventory room, like me. Oops.
Okay. So we're gonna take a quick look at that in one second here. All right. Let's oh talk to the box. This sturdy steel box has a thick leather leather handle on top, but there's no apparent way to open the thing. It appears to be welded shut. There are a number of narrow slits along one side, though you can't see into the box through them. A sickly sweet rotting smell wafts out from this or wafts out from the slits. As you examine the container more closely, it shifts slightly in your hands. Something's moved inside. It. There's a man's voice from within. Oh, there! Is someone there? By chance, my name's Mertwin. Anyone? Hail? Yes, greetings. Thank the powers. Have you seen my body, perchance? It's hard to miss him. Stumbles about with a silly wooden head on his shoulders. He must have worn his feet down to stubs looking for me by now. I don't think so. Oh dear. Well, that probably been a bit too much to hope for, eh? In any case, it's probably shambling around the Civic Fest Hall in the northeastern corner of the Clerk's Ward. Could I by any chance persuade you to take me there, good sir? Okay, sure. How splendid. I thank you kindly then, sir. If you don't mind now, we'll hold off speaking any further until I'm with my body again. Alright. So we have someone's head, which we are going to bring back to his body, and we're going to go into the alchemist. Or not the alchemist, this is the linguist's home. This short scholarly man, a tight nervous frown on his face, looks you up and down. Greetings, I am Finnum. I must beg your pardon, sir, but I care little for guests, invited or otherwise. So unless you have business with me, I would ask you to leave. He does have some questions. I would have to. Or I would have you know that I am a scholar and a linguist, sir. While I shall happily entertain any questions regarding my field of study, language, and the like, I can be of no help to you in other matters. Okay, bye. All I think right. we come back to him later for a quest, if I can remember correctly. Or do we? Chosen to grace my home once more, have you? What is it you wish me this time? Nothing really. She had some questions, nothing. He's supposed to tell us something, but he's not. Okay, well, we'll deal with that later. Hmm. I'm gone. I'm gone. I thought for sure he gave us a quest. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it's later on. I don't know. We'll figure that out. What was this building? I don't remember what this one is. Uh, let's go inside and find out. I have no idea. It's a big building, whatever it is. There's an advocate here. This man is dressed in soft blue robes covered with intricate designs. Yet despite their opulence, however, the robes look wrinkled and worn. You place the man's age somewhere between middle age and early 60s. The worry lines make an exact determination difficult. As you enter, the man turns slowly towards you. As he does, you are suddenly struck with a terrible sense that you know this man, or did at one time. Greetings. The man squints at you as if trying to place you. Yes, is there something I can help you with? Who are Updated you? My journal. I am Ionis. He studies you and frowns. Were you looking for me? I don't know. What is this place? I am an advocate. These are my offices. Ionis's voice takes on an irritated edge. Do you seek counsel? If not, perhaps you had best test your courtesy elsewhere. Or curiosity elsewhere. Updated my an advocate? Journal. What's that? Mort breaks in in a whisper. He's saying he's a lawyer. A counselor. One of those burks who rattle their bone boxes at the courts. Yannis's frown deepens. An advocate provides counsel and helps others navigate the labyrinths of Sigil's legal system, arranges legacies for citizens to ensure that their property is divided as they choose upon death, defend those in Sigil's courts those who have been wrongly accused. He pauses. Did you need any help in any of these areas? Legacies. They are contracts that are deliverable at the death of the client. They provide specifics on how a person's possessions are to be divided upon the event of their demise. I have also heard them called wills. Are they anything like the dustman contracts? Oh my no! The dustman contracts, while well, they are deliverable at the time of the client's death, bequeath the client's body to the dustman, not a pleasant business at all. But some who are poor of means find the dustman contracts to be a means of support. How would one go about invalidating a dustman contract? He frowns slightly. One is already signed. Little or nothing can be done once the signature is in place. The dustman contract is really quite specific on the destination of the corpse after death. Without the destruction of the contract, there's really nothing that could be done. I see. Do I owe you anything for this information? I am not the sort to charge others for giving them aid of this sort. He smiles slightly. I am an advocate, not a rug merchant, and greed is not permitted to step in my office. I thank you. I'm grateful. Perhaps there's something else you can help me with. Very well. What else can I help you with? Have we met before? The man studies you for a moment, frowning in thought. The wrinkles on his face become more pronounced as he does so, and you are struck again by the toll that age seems to have placed on him. No, yet you seem familiar. Yet, 
He continues to study your features, then shakes his head. I will concede that there is something familiar about you, sir, and I apologize for any insult my failing memory may be giving you at this moment. I have been preoccupied with some time now. Have we met before? Truth. I think so. I can't really remember myself. Hmm. Fascinating for us both, it would seem. Never mind. Perhaps you can help me with something else. That's it. He does know us, but we don't remember him, and he does not remember us. Hmm. We are going to have to come back to him later. I should remember we need to go somewhere else before he gives us the cool information we require. All right. Hmm. <laughs> Okay, so we've already dealt with him. Uh, we have this place to go now. There's not a lot in here. Actually, there's almost nothing in here. Except for a guy named Bootshiner. Gone, We're right. not going to talk to him. He's not the person I was looking for. Gone. Matter of course, we already talked to them. There, these guys. These are the guys I was looking for. The drunken mage, Namel, able to ponder thought. Those people. Ah, sweet smell this sense. older man looks somewhat bookish. His clothing and accessories are extremely clean, neat, and well cared for. And he often pauses to brush some fleck of dust or lint off of them. A symbol resembling a stylized dagger pierced upwards through a flame is embroidered upon his tunic. Greetings! The man's eyes pass over you, gleaming as they fix on Mort. Oh, I say! Would you look at that? A floating skull? Mort turns and looks behind him. What? Where? Where? The man gasps by the unjust laws of Tuini, the merciless. Who? He suddenly covers his mouth and looks at Anna apologetically. Sorry, sorry. The man was a horrible tyrant, now long dead. His name should never have been spoken so. Tis rather vulgar. My deepest apologies, my lady. I did not mean to offend. Anna shrugs, rolling her eyes. Talk as you like, Cutter. I care not wait for what you say. Unless you're rattling your bone box about me, that is. Trying to get his attention. He turns back to Mort. But behold, a skull. Buoyant, levitating off ground. Cognitive of its environment. And possessing hearing, speaking, and seeing capabilities. He act. He turns to you as if suddenly... A confidant, this is truly one of the reasons the planes shall never become dull to me, sir. Just when you think you have seen everything, the planes show you yet another corner to peer around, and he raises his hands gloriously. Suddenly, whole new wondrous vistas are open to you. Actually, the talking floating skull thing is quite common. Right up there with self-resurrecting amnesiacs scouring sigil for the lost identities, the man ignores you, looking to Mort instead. I say, skull, it begins. More gas, look behind you, another floating skull! Let Mort have his fun. The man seems to have forgotten you entirely. This is turning in shock to look for this other floating skull. No! Where? Where? Right where I'm pointing. There! Where? I cannot see it! Mort speaks with a mock aspiration. You just missed it. A whole parade of them. Probably never happened again in a million revelations of the Great Ring. He turns and frumps. I sense you possess a particular degree of mockery. Mort bobs, slightly as if shrugging. I prefer to refer to it as keen insights into human nature. I'm gonna get the man's attention again. He seems to see you for the first time. The man's eyes widen. By the unjust laws of Tuni, the... He catches himself looking apologetic. I say, you are alright, you look... He fumbles for the words. Hurt. I'm alright. Aye, it looked, hurts to look at you, it does. Very amusing, Anna. I had some questions, sir. The man nods eagerly. Of course, of course, I am most happy to answer your questions. I can, young sir. What do you know of Ravel Puzzlewell? Ravel, if she truly existed, and there was little to prove that she did, was a night hag, one of the inhabitants of the Grey Waste. One of the lower planes believed by some to be the worst of the lower planes. Continue to listen. He continues, as the legend goes, Ravel was mazed several centuries ago. She was believed to be of being a mistress of many strange magics, and apparently her presence in Sigil constituted a threat of the, to the lady. I'm afraid that I know little of her. We already know about mazed, so we're not going to... I guess we can listen. The mazes, these are creations by the lady. If you see... Or sorry, you see, she takes a bit... A small piece of sigil, copies it, then uses a portal to place the copied bit into the deep ethereal. Once there, the piece of sigil then becomes a demiplane, an endless maze that curls and twists about itself. Continue to listen. He continues, the lady uses these mazes to imprison those who threaten her power. When she is determined that you are to be imprisoned, there is no escaping them. There is believed to have been a way out of each maze, but it is most likely extremely difficult. We already got out of one. Uh, we don't really have anything else to ask him. He doesn't have much else to say to us. Namel! This tall, slender woman, sipping wine from a small ceramic cup, appears to be looking for someone. Her facial features are elegantly exotic, and the woman's ears, though partially covered by her long hair, can be seen to come to sharp points. Greetings. The woman turns to face you, violet eyes flashing like flawless chips of amethyst. Her speech is as music, and you can hear a faint musical tinkling. A hundred tiny crystal bells as she speaks. Each word lingers in your ears, as if 
they were unwilling to relinquish the exquisite sound. Namel turned to face the scarred, dowered stranger. She asks what he wished of her. She speaks in the third person. Wow. Ha! Anna sneers at more. Stop your drooling, you leer and skull. My, what a hot-blooded little chit. Starve for attention? I could drool over you too if you're just jealous. More starts floating towards Anna, making wet, slavering noises. Get a hair's breadth closer, Skull, and I'll see that not in one of your chattering teeth lies within a hundred paces of another. More stops abruptly, turning away while muttering and unintelligibly. You're Namel. I was told you know the command word for this decanter. The woman makes no move to touch or examine the decanter, but only speaks. Namel took it from the stranger, turning it in her hands. Had she seen his like before, she thought. Perhaps, yes. She remembered it now. She returned the decanter, whispering into his ear as she did so. Uh, you realize you know the word now. Nildenosage. Though you're certain the word never, or the woman never whispered the word to you, but merely said she did. She blinks at you. Would the stranger leave her now, satisfied with what she had told him? Not just yet. Are you looking for somebody? Where could she be? Navelle wondered. Her companion, Aylwin, was supposed to have met her here days ago. The woman sighs miserably. The air around her grows chill with her sadness. How long must she search for this vast foreign city before she finds her dearest friend? I could help you find your friend. What does she look like? Namel claps her hands together and bows her head to you. She would be so pleased to hear news of her friend. She told the kind stranger what Aylwin looked like so that he would know her should he come across her. An image forms in your mind, a woman who resembles Namel, but with golden eyes and hair of a fiery crimson. I'll oh, return if I find her. We're actually going to go grab her right now. She is right here. Or so. Approximately in this area. Mm. At this point, we can go get the fire mage if we want to. We are going to go release him. And he's kind of a cool character. And there's Aelin right there. This tall, slender woman occasionally looks up from her cup of wine to scan the surrounding patrons and passers-by. Her facial features are elegantly exotic, and her eyes, a brilliant golden color, catch the light sparkling as she looks about. Greetings! She regards you carefully for a moment before replying. She speaks slowly and carefully, avoiding direct eye contact with you. I, Eowyn, return your greetings. Eowyn, your friend Namel is looking for you. She begins to smile, but then covers her mouth with her hand and looks down in her drink. I, Eowyn, am most pleased to hear of Namel. May I, Aelwyn, persuade you to tell her of this place? Yes, I'll do that for you. She looks at you directly, and just for the briefest of moments before she casts her eyes back down to her drink, your senses are awash with warm, comfortable feeling, pure happiness. I, Aelwyn, thank you. It's my pleasure. Actually, of course, farewell. I don't really need to know about her. And neither do we. We are just excellent people at wandering back and forth. All right, Namel. Where's my main character? No. Oh. The woman smiles as she greets you. Her beauty no less breathtaking than the first time you saw her. Namel held her breath as the stranger approached her. Had he found Aelwyn? She wondered. I found Aelwyn. She was looking for you too. Namel's li lips form a perfect smile. An infectious happiness radiates from her, clinging to you like a sweet-smelling warmth. Namel was overjoyed to hear of her friend. Was Aelwyn close by? She's at another cafe east of here, across this part of the ward. Namel thanked the man for his wondrous news. Soon she would go visit her oldest friend Eowyn. Now, though, she would reward the stranger. I'll wait for her to reward us. She would draw the stranger close, laying her hand upon his cheek and kissing the pale leathery skin of his cheek. Life would flow into him, invigorating him. This, this was to be his reward. Wait. Max HP increased permanently. As you wait, there is a light tingling sensation across your body and chest. The feeling spreads across the whole of your body and you begin to feel stronger, more animated. My thanks, Namel. Farewell. We got three hit points for that. All right. Ah, uh, yes. I think that's pretty well it. And I got a bunch of experience for that. That's pretty much the whole area. I am going to, uh, we are going to go to the, oh, wait, did we go to the Art and Curio Galleria? No. I don't think we did. We'll do the brothel later for sure, but let's go to the art gallery. Because the brothel has lots of quests in it. All right. Lots of things to do. I'm not even sure what's in this building, to be honest. I can't remember. Let's go take a look at the stuff. The dark birds of Ocanthus. Several shards of black crystal, or ice, swirl within the freezing wind that this ornate pedestal gives forth. 
Each shard looks razor sharp. Touching or grabbing one would be perilous. A placard on the pedestal reads, The Dark Birds of Acanthus. I'm gonna touch one. As you reach out to touch one of the whirling shards, your finger encounters the icy winds that rise from the pedestal. Instantly, a coat of numbing frost forms around your fingers, causing you momentarily to draw back. I'm gonna place my finger in and touch one. You thrust your fingers into the frigid, numbing wind. Unbeknownst to you, your four finger freezes solid. As one of the black shards spins into it, your fingertip breaks off with a sharp crack and goes skittering across the galleria floor. The icy dark birds remain in their whirling orbit as you wait for your fingertip to grow back. Let's hope no one saw any of that. Except for that guy. We're not going to bother talking to sensates. Stained glass. The hundreds of chips of translucent green glass, which make up the stained glass window, don't appear to be held together by anything, but rather remain free-floating and mysteriously suspended within the iron frame's boundaries. The shards ripple and move in slow waves, causing bizarre patterns to fluctuate across the window's surface, as various portions of it refract the galleria's light in different directions. A small placard beside, er, beside the window reads, Arcadian stained glass window. I'm gonna touch the glass. You reach out to touch the undulating glass shards, but find you cannot do so. Your hand stops just short of the surface of the glass. I do want to punch it, so we're going to save first. You succeed in only bruising your knuckles. The glass may as well be sheet iron. Okay. <laughs> that was worth a shot. This painting shows an enormous granite keep, a hideous thing, long and low, covered in leering gargoyles, suspended in what looks to be the night sky. A cloud of crimson and violet vapor swirls in the background along the right side of the painting. A placard reads simply, The Library. There's some more paintings here. That one looks like it's moving. Oh. Like a TV screen. Let's go take a look at that one. A set of four paintings which portray an empty beach in the dead of night. The air around the painting smells faintly of brine, and the painted sea seems to ebb and flow against the darkened shore. A placard reads, The Kara Sutheran Shoreline. I'm gonna sniff the painting. The surface of the painting smells strongly of sea air. Touch the painting. As you place your hand on the painting, not knowing quite what to expect, but it is merely a texture of painted canvas that you feel beneath your fingertips. That's it. Okay, fair enough. There is a quest we have to do in here later, but it's not yet. This painting is a dark cityscape, a faraway view of some giant center of civilization being burned to the ground. The streets of the place are empty, however, absent of soldiers, refugees, or even corpses. The placket reads, The Folly of Udo. We can't even really see them very well. Let's go to see this thing. This is what we want to see. The statue looks like it is about to make some angry proclamation. The sculpture has captured the essence of fury magnificently. The chiseled tension lines around the neck and forehead alone must have taken many long months to get correct. Fine cracks run over the entire statue, and there is a plaque attached to its base. I'm going to read the plaque. The plaque reads, The statue is believed to be the final fate of the Ethersyrian Ather sorcerer Gangroy Gohaiden. Attacked by a conclave of rival sorcerers at the height of his dream madness, he was imprisoned within a spell that turned his flesh into stone. Gangroy Gaiden is said to have been frozen with a final awful curse still upon his lips, a curse so terrible that it was never meant to be spoken by the lips of a living man. I'm going to examine the statue and examine the cracks. You examine the cracks that run like a network of fine black veins along the statue's surface at one point near its inner arm. Is a section where an entire splinter of stone looks ready to come off. I'm gonna break the piece off. You reach for the section of the forearm where the cracks have formed. Grip it firmly and strike it with your forge hammer. There is the barest sound of metal striking on stone, and a splinter the size of a dagger snaps off the statue. Got it. As it comes free, you feel water begin to trickle on the back of your hand. You watch a tear well up in the eyes of the statue as a splinter of the arm comes off in your hands. You quickly and quietly tuck away the splinter and turn away from the crying statue. What did we get? It is a dagger plus one poison's target. It is fragile and breakable. Apparently it breaks. Well, that would suck. I don't want it to break. Alright. What else do we have in here? What's this? Ruby statue. A brilliant ruby statuette stands on this pedestal, carved in the image of a winged humanoid. The figure is either demonic or angelic in nature, but it's difficult to tell because it refracts the light in the galleria strangely. There is no placard indicating what exactly the statue is. We'll get back to that eventually as well. What's this? A battle horn. A massive horn of a be of beaten lead, wound with brazen chains. 
The horn is horribly mangled, as if some tremendous force had crushed it. Jagged blades protrude along its length, almost as if it were meant to be used as a club by some gigantic creature, as well as a battle horn. A placard mounted beneath the horn reads, The Cleansing Horn of Asheron. I'm gonna put my head against the wall and try and blow the horn. Try as you might, you can get no sound to issue from the massive horn. Your lips come away from the mouthpiece, tasting of blood, smoke, and metal. I'm gone. Metal. Yeah. What is that thing? The animated chain. The animated chain, bloody iron chain, coiling and uncoiling upon itself. The chain seems to bend and weave like the spine of a snake. A small placard reads, Kaiden's animated chain from a jangling hider. Hitter. Hider? Touch the chain. The chain is slightly warm to the touch as if it were alive. You notice that in various barbs, tiny hooks, needles, and other small sharp bits are welded along the chain's length. There's one thing in here we needed to actually see, and I can't remember which one it is. Um. No, that is the right one. We got it already. Sorry. All right. All right. I had to write it down, but my notes suck. Like really suck. I need better notes. So we got the thing we needed for now. We will be coming back here later on, because there is more to do there. Later on, though. All right. Um. So in the next video, we're gonna go into the brothel. We're gonna get our next character. That's our goal. No, you... Well, maybe you can. Alright, Jalmy's messenger. This slender young man approaches you wearing a somewhat worried expression. One thousand pardons, sir, but I am looking for a certain man. I think you might be able to help me. Oh, how so? I am a messenger, sir. Who seeks a man, it said, cannot die. A scarred man, for whom death is nothing but the most trivial of annoyances. You match the admittedly vague description that was given, sir. I had wondered if you were he. Guess that's me. He nods and then bows to you. A message for you then, sir. Mistress Jalami of House Sirma, Lady of the High Standing, has sent me. Mistress Jalami would meet you within the Civic Fest Hall, where she would make a proposal, of which I know nothing, to you. Should you choose to seek her out, she wears green silks, trimmed with gold, and his hair the color of blue steel. That is the extent of my message, sir. Farewell. Oh, Wait, where's the Civic Fest Hall? In the northeast corner of the spot of the clerk's ward, sir. Tis a lot of structure. It should be easy to spot. Farewell. Alright, so, next video, brothel time, and we will get our fifth character. I guess we could technically get a sixth character right away. Um, we could very easily go get Ignis. And I'm kind of tempted to, but we don't need a second mage, that's the problem. We have me, and I'm a better mage than Ignis is. So, we will ponder it. Yeah, I'll think about the characters I want to bring along with me, because I know I want to bring along the Cleric. She's really, really good. And I was thinking of bringing on the Modron, because he's awesome, or Valor, because he's a really cool character later in the game. It's a tough call. Alright, I'll ponder it, and then in the next video we'll go into the brothel. Like always, if you guys have any suggestions or comments, or if you guys want to chime in on who I should bring along in this group, I will leave it up to you guys. If you guys want to see uh, the Cleric, which is Saving from Grace, Falling from grace, falling from grace, not saving from grace. I don't know where I was going with that. Or fall from grace. Whatever her name is, the cleric. Uh, the Modron Cube Valor, who is an animated suit of empty armor, which is really cool. Or Ignis, the fire mage. Let me know. Like always, I'll see you guys in the next video.